All right. Well, I just wanted to welcome everyone to the very first Cars and Coffee event of 2019. It's uh, very exciting. And I'm so glad that you came, uh, despite the weather. I know it's been iffy all week, and people have been st stopping me saying, Tim, how's Cars and Coffee going to go if there's a storm? And you always worry about that. But I'm just so glad to see the parking lot out there full of really cool cars and, and uh, so many familiar faces and also some new faces in the crowd. Is this microphone working OK? It's kind of cutting out. Hang on a second. Technology. <laughs> well, I gave it a tune up. How's that sound? All right. Well, We're super. Back on track. <laughs> There's always at least one glitch, right? Well, I'm so excited today to welcome you all to the Museum of American Speed. If you don't know me, my name's Tim Matthews. I'm the curator of the museum. And one of the most exciting things that we get to do is not only have the cars and coffee events here at Speedway Motors and at the museum, but we get to invite some of our great friends to the museum and uh, let them tell you a little bit about themselves. And today, it's my honor to introduce a, a man that I truly have learned so much about in the last couple of days. You know, you've all seen the old Dos Aki's commercials, the most interesting man in the world. Well, I think this guy's him. I mean, he's done just about everything. And hot rodding is just a small part of that. So, you know, over the last couple days, we've had conversations about interior design, women's clothing, uh, Mr. Tishman. I mean, he's been everywhere. He's circumnavigated the globe a few times. Uh, so I, I have no doubt you're going to be entertained with what we're going to share with you today. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my good friend, Dan Woods. You know, I'd like to thank all of you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming today. And first and foremost, we want to thank all the vets that made it possible for us to be here. This is Memorial Weekend, and we've all lost somebody and know somebody. I'm a Vietnam vet, and we cannot forget our vets, no matter what. So here, here. That's here. Absolutely. That's important. It truly is. So thank you for coming. This is an amazing place, and to Bill Smith and his wife and his family to carry this on. And I, I'm just overwhelmed at the amount of details and interesting things and stuff, because I'm mm -hmm. creator of things and stuff. So <laughs> you could spend months in here and never see it all. Months. I mean, it's literally incredible love affair with the automobile and the automobile industry. So we have spent about a day and a half, and I haven't even touched the beginning of this thing. <laughs> so, uh, with, you want to start? With sure. I, I guess first I'd just ask, can, all, can everyone hear Dan okay? Maybe hold the mic a little closer, Dan. Like that? There, yeah, yeah. All right. No he's problem. like me. Very, he's animated, so yeah. It, well, it, I'm always accused of having being loud. <laughs> so, usually I don't even use a microphone. I just talk. <laughs> So I guess to get started, Daniel, some of the things, yeah, the way we always have these interviews is just like a couple of car guys, you know, talking you about your past. And, and, you know, obviously you've done some amazing things, but take us, start us at the very beginning. You know, when you started as a young man, uh, you know, how did you get interested in cars and, and working on projects? Was your dad a, a car person? Or? No, my dad worked at a dairy and ran a bottle washing machine in the days of milk and bottles. And it was sort of... I have no clue because there was nobody in my family that liked cars. And this very first picture right there, I think I was, that's 1953, so I was seven years old. And it's like a big wheel, and I have no clue. My mom, I just found that picture about 10 years ago. I don't remember why I did it, how I did it, but I made that. And it's just weird, you know. And she wrote Hot Rod Danny on the top of the picture. And we had no interest in it. My dad could have cared less about what car he was driving or anything else. So when people ask me this question, I really, truly can't give a, you know, I just was drawn to it, I guess. And uh, I went from that to this next picture. I built, I found this in a, a tree, like in some eucalyptus trees. Oh, wow. It's got Model T running boards on it. I think I was nine. And it, put a Cushman clutch on that because the next door neighbor had a machine shop and I lived in that thing. I mean the minute I was out of school I was in the yard going around every tree and everywhere possible 
it, it's just part of your, becomes part of your blood, I guess. You all know because you're car people. And at the end of the day, I can't, when people ask me this exact question, how, did, I don't know where the passion came from, just within. <laughs> and I probably, every one of you got your own story about this, because it just happens. And, and, and things, when, things like that don't just fall together. I mean, what are your earliest memories of working with tools? Because as I look at some of these early pictures, I think, gosh, you know, there's some skill there. Well, in this case, I found, I don't know what that was originally. So the frame and the motor, I mean, the wheel, it didn't have a motor on it. So all I had to really do was mount the motor and do odds and ends. And my, we had a little workshop next to the one car garage with the hand drills and files and hacksaws. I didn't know what a power anything was. And somehow it came together <laughs> out of desperation. And uh, then I, this was really a lot of fun. By this time, I figured out some things. So. I went to the junkyard and that's got an English Ford rear end. And we had a home in the desert. So these were, so I could go out in the desert now. Couldn't afford a car or a Jeep or anything. So it's an English Ford rear end, a 1937 Chevy transmission, which we all bought for 12 bucks at the junkyard. I didn't have a car or anything, so I brought it home behind a bicycle one piece at a time. <laughs> <coughs> Where the pilot bearing was, I put the a clutch plate on and took a bicycle sprocket and screwed that to the clutch plate and then took a Cushman clutch again. I was in love with Cushman clutches. <laughs> so I put that on this Wisconsin motor, so I had three speeds, but it was like 7,000 to one RPM. So it wouldn't go, <laughs> it wouldn't go four miles an hour because it was going through this bicycle sprocket in low gear. And it was just angle iron frame from an old bed, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I drove that for, I think, two years out in the desert and we, my best friend and I, we'd get stuck in that thing, but you could lift it up, move it around, turn around, whatever. And with having made this up, this video, I just realized, I think less than five years after I built that car, I built my milk truck, which you'll see here in a minute. And the skill set to go from that little thing there to, well, this, we did this, I was, I think, 14 or 15. A friend of mine, and nobody had a, a body for a tea bucket. So that fiberglass bucket, we learned how to do fiberglass, and we really didn't know what we were doing. I was 14. It's at least three quarters of an inch thick. <laughs> <laughs> it weighs so much, it took two guys to lift it up. You know, but I was so proud of that, I had no idea. You can see, we rented a, a, a chicken uh, ranch. The lady down the street, her husband died. So those buildings, I cleaned it all out, and it was just a few block, or a few street houses down from my parents. So we put that, it has a Chrysler motor in it, you'll see the next picture. And uh, it was for a friend of mine, he had the money to pay for it, which wasn't anything at that time. And he let me, I did all the work, no, junkyard motor, vertical steering, nothing, ex right, but and that Ford, I ended up sectioning that. You know, I had no clue, never done body work in my life, and I sectioned six inches out of that Ford and chopped the top. And I didn't have a driver's license yet. So, and there was no, you know, cutting, th I did it with a hacksaw blade, just out of total desperation. I mean, you got no tools, you have no, when ignorance is bliss in the building, you know, and it goes through everything, until somebody showed me a body grinder, it was like, holy crap, you don't have to do all this by hand. <laughs> so anyhow, that was, uh, like, and that was a, that was a big Hemi too. That was an extended bell housing 331. Yeah, and, and a, you know, it built the hydro transfer. I, I would go and it's, I worked on that Buccielli here with Mr. Tishman and he calls that the Tishman University. Well, Dan Woods' university was just necessity. You know, it's like they say, it's the father invention. I had no clue how to do any of this, so I'd go ask somebody. And he saw this little kid show up and you know, I'd clean their floor and they taught me how to do this. I'd clean their floor, I'd wash this and I'd do that. So I learned how to do, you know, how to build a transmission. This is what I'm most proud of. Just imagine, it's 1963. I didn't graduate high school in 64. I get a Model A frame. I get enthralled with this little model I saw in this uh, picture. I had no hot rod books. I had never looked at a hot rod magazine. I didn't know anything about it, but I'm gonna build a milk truck because my dad works in a dairy. And I'd ridden in a lot of milk trucks. So they were building apartments down the street. I get the Man, I asked him if I can get some plywood. He says, sure. There were scraps. You know, look at that and say that this next picture is really good. This is funny. 
So my mom made this little scrapbook, like I said, I just found this. Now you look at that thing on the left and say, what the heck is this guy thinking? This is gonna be a show card? You know, it looks like a piece of crap that just, you know, somebody should have thrown away, right? And yet, but I, I had the foresight and, I, you know, let's get this thing done. And my dad taught me, when you start something, you finish it. And that's all there is to it. And all that fiberglass, McDonnell Douglas, and Rockwell corporations were just a bicycle right away, and on Tuesdays and Thursdays they had sales where they sold scrap. So if you look on those panels of fiberglass, I couldn't afford to buy fiberglass sheet. So they were just scrap pieces, and I'd be excited if one was two foot by three because it covered part of it. So all those seams, I had to take a long board with wore out sandpaper to get them smooth to put the next coat on. So this next one, I went from that and we, uh, that was the first day I got some primer on it. I was so excited. It was starting to look like something to me. Everybody else thought it was nuts. <laughs> and, you know, and my background, I, I grew up in Paramount, California. <coughs> Excuse me. And Reith Automotive, the service center, Keith Black, B&M Transmissions, Doug Thorley Headers, Larry Watson. Uh, it just goes on and on with right there within bicycle riding. I could ride my bicycle to any of those places. So like the six twos on there, Joe Reese sold me those for 30 bucks, the manifold and everything for that Pontiac motor. And you know, I made payments. I'd show up my bicycle, give five bucks, and pretty soon I got to have it. <clears throat> Bolt that on, it was a major day. So then we went from that, <coughs> excuse me. Mm -hmm. This is Mark Morton, if you know, it Mark or not. He did Hop Up Magazine, and he's been, he brought that back to life. Well, we were, you know, schoolmates from junior high on. So him and I are sitting in that thing. This is our high school newspaper. You know, and you see, this place is milk truck. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and, uh, but we're excited. You know, it's coming along. And then, uh, this was the first day I actually had the motor and everything, and I got some, temporary rear wheels on it. Mm. We transitioned from that to, uh, I was working at Art Crone's Body Shop. I did a 1901 locomobile and I did a 1912 Buick because I was doing this fiberglass. And you know, I'd go there to learn to do the paint work and I started sanding cars to make money to pay for this. So I'd do that after school. And we, we'll mm. watch a couple pictures here. I finally got it painted. Tom Kelly put the emblem on it. And we were just getting ready to go to the car show. And here in a minute, I'll show you this funny. Uh, I sanded the entire block, rear end, transmission with emery paper. Took all the casting off so I could get it chrome plated someday. Now, you can't even imagine how long that took. <laughs> this is dedication. This is like my fingers were wore out. I got a neighbor kid, sucked him in on it too. So Johnny Kelso helped me sand this thing. And when they restored it, and you know you're getting old when they're restoring the cars you built in your lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> so they were galloping Ford, you know, Jim Sh uh, Shutton, Dave Shutton, restored that about eight, ten years ago. And when he stripped the paint off, he goes, Dan, the block's smooth as glass. I go, yeah, I sanded it with emery paper. <laughs> I didn't have a little, any grinder or anything else. I did it by hand. And the front radius rods came out of a junkyard, and that's what's important about all of this. It was a junkyard, and I'd go over there and find things, and they were uh, Brunswick bowling pin setter machines, and they had hymens on them. And I go, outstanding, I'm gonna put those on my car. <laughs> so it's just a combination of a whole bunch of crap turned out <laughs> looking like a car. So this is the first day I drove it. I went down the street to the parking lot, and uh, was all excited. This is quite funny. I hear about this all the time. Dan, how did you come up with a single coil spring in the front? Mm -hmm. Well, if you start looking, that was my spring perch, and I was going to put a spring, but I had to make all this other, and I went down to the local Chevrolet dealer, and I, they had, somebody had ordered this coil spring for a Corvair Turbo, a car that had a turbo, so it was a heavier duty spring, and nobody picked it up. <coughs> so he says, I could buy that for 12 bucks. I'm going to a single coil spring. So then I put that in there 
and if you see there's no pan or rod or anything so i just put those two little plates out there and put you know as a, a shock absorber and a pan or so i had no clue what i was doing but it worked <laughs> so the transmission i went to the chrome shop and they were the gentleman was kind enough and felt sorry for me i would clean up and he taught me how to run the tanks you know so i buffed everything used their equipment and he just i think i for the, all the chrome in that car, I think I paid less than 200 bucks and it took about four months. But you know, I did it all myself at his facility. <clears throat> I put a steering box in it. I think it was a Corvair. And not being an engineer or a car person, I put the drag link in it and I turned right and the car went left. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, you, you, go, you go in the house, you've been working on this thing for a year and a half, and you're going, boy, did I screw up. <laughs> so if you look hard right there to the left, there's a bell crank. So that's my solution. You know, it goes into the bell crank and reverses the steering. <laughs> but I'm 17 years old, for God's sakes, you know. I'm not a brain surgeon. And what's, what's interesting is, is, you know, over at Speedway, we sell reverse Corvair steering boxes like hotcakes, but... You actually, Dan, you were telling me about how you reversed a box. When did that happen? When I started building tea buckets, you know, I fell in love with the Corvair steering box, and it's very simple. You just take it apart and go, you know, I would ream the holes so it wouldn't, and put a seal in it, just turn it over. And I did a ton of those. I sold a lot, of, a lot of reverse Corvair steering boxes. But this was the learning curve, found out you're not going to make it work until you get it going the wrong direction. <laughs> so the rear wheels, Mickey Thompson got those tires, I think Firestone or good, I can't remember who, for his Indy car, and he had extras that had been on the track for just a short period of time, and he sold me those for like $15 each, which was a lot of money to me, but nobody, nobody in the face of the earth had ever made a 14-inch wide rim, and everybody, you know, especially, I wanted it deep, so that's quarter-inch well casing. They weigh, you know, and they're solid, and then the back plate is a half inch T1A, because we were sure it needed all that strength to hold it up, you know, having that, and there's no drop center in it, so now how do you get tire on it? Oh, well, you can just slip it on a big diesel truck, so I put a, you know, slip ring on the back. So it's got a simple truck ring on the back, and put a big tube in it, and never look back. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was so proud of that chassis. And, had no clue. I, you have to understand, I hadn't been to any car shows. I don't know anything about any of this stuff. And Joe Perez did the interior. And same thing. I went over there and helped him work on his house. I got another gentleman, Jim Babs, made the radiator. I got to Gilbert Metal Products and bought their reproduction parts for a reproduction radiator. So he was one of the few people that worked on my car besides Joe Perez. And we showed up. And this is where I met Ed Newton. He drew these up so we could go to the car show. And my friend and I still had them, so I donated <clears throat> these to the, you can see they're well worn. <laughs> <laughs> so this was the beginning of you know, the whole t-shirt craze. And LA Times, when I got to the Trident's car show, and you've got to wonder, who, these people are just trying to sort of avant-garde and lactic expressionism. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, it's a hot rod, for God's sakes. It doesn't need a big title. So I showed up at the car show. Gary Cannon came out, the promoter of the Trident Show at Sports Arena. That's the day I got there. Nobody knew this car was in existence. They didn't know it was being built. And George Barris had just redone Tommy Ivo's car, and it had it set in the lobby. Out goes Tommy Ivo. I get slid in. George is mad at me. Who's this kid? Why is this thing in the front thing? And I won Grand Sweepstakes and Best Paint, the first show I was ever in. I love telling this story. The two rear wheels, when I bought the rear end, were on, you know, just wore out tires, and they gave them to me to drag it home. But when you're not smart enough to think about, I should maybe measure one of these wheels. The one, I think it's the left fender's an inch and a half higher than the right fender, because I just built them right to the height of the the tire that was on there when I got the rear end. <laughs> but things happen. <laughs> so I was quite proud of it. It ended up on the cover in 19... I just graduated high school when that cover came out. Uh, what year was that? Pardon? What year was that? 1965. 
So it started getting accolades, and I was the first car in the United States to get paid to come to a car show. Gary Candy made a contract. Now, I'm a young kid. I don't do business, but he's offering, I go home and tell my parents, 500 bucks to go to a car show this far away and 250 for this, so that sounds like a great deal. Signed a contract, and that was the downfall of this thing. Because within about oh, four shows, Larry Watson had just developed, if you see those stripes on it, that's, there's three stripes with three different colored stripes in between. He built a six-headed gun, and that six-headed gun came out of a pressure pot. And they, you could put different colors in it, and then you had big spray guns with one trigger. And he was bound and determined to make this. So some guy let him go down the side of their 64 Impala, and he went to Gary Cannon and says, I want to do the milk truck. I knew Larry. And I said, I really don't want to do this, but I was under contract. So they went in there on a Friday afternoon, and by Saturday morning, I hated it. Because it, looked, it should have been white. So unfortunately, you know, I had to live with this. So now it's about two shows later, and uh, I'm in the, we've started the Early Times Car Club in Southern California, and we're all driving our cars. And I built that to drive it, not to show it. So. <coughs> I see this tea bucket at the Great Western National Show, and I fell in love with it. Don Oaks had built it. It's got a little 215 two Buick. We'll see it later. So I walk up to this gentleman. And I go, excuse me, are you interested in trading that? He says, well, for what? And I go, a milk truck. And he goes, well, do you know the guy that owns it? I go, yeah, me. <laughs> he says, are you serious? I go, yeah, I'll trade you straight across. Right now, you've got to take it to these car shows. So <clears throat> the show closed at 10 o'clock that night. I told the promoter, because he knew me, I says, that car belongs to him, and I'm taking my tea bucket out of here. I'm driving. So he took advantage of that, got Craiger to sponsor him. They put the blower on it, all the Craiger pieces, and started a thing called California Show Cars. So when they restored it, I tried and begged them to do it in the white color, but that's with the Craiger accessories, and because they, they made a model of it, and it sold worldwide. I think it sold out four different times, Eldon Toys. And, uh, but it's not what I built. I mean, I did, but I didn't. And, you know, I'm not completely satisfied that they did this restoration that way. I tr begged them to do it white like it was originally built. And to you guys' credit in this museum, you go back to the original car, not to some iteration in mid-term. But then again, they made a model. That's the model, so that's what they want. And it's in, on display in Galpin Ford down in Van Nuys, California. They've got a museum there. <coughs> They've got five of my cars in there now, so. And it's in some pretty good company, right, Dan? What other cars are in that collection? Uh, they've got. Uh, I know the Roth shop truck the is there. Roth cars, things that we did for TV shows. There's uh, just a multitude of cars. It's a great collection of just show cars, you know. And he's got some muscle cars too. Yeah. <laughs> so this was the studio shots for the magazine cover when this was redone in 2009 or whatever. So it makes you feel good that somebody's taken the time to do this. And I can't say anything bad. That's a 60 old steering wheel. And I drove it. I mean, it ran just fine down the road. Yeah, but for, it was 2009 when they restored it. That, that little model there is what got me started in the whole idea of the thing. I, that was the first set of Buick, back up, oh, never mind. Sure. The first set of Buick wire wheels that had ever been done reversed. So that became one of my signature things. I started reversing Buick wire wheels on that car in 1964 when I built it. And the, when we chrome plated those big wheels, I forgot to tell you, the back was all terrible. They couldn't get the chrome to flash in there. So we made a postered piece of that velour and put in the wheels. <laughs> and it was white. <laughs> They have Buick wires on. So I kept the Buick wires and put them on the tea bucket. This just came out in the SEMA last year. They doing the SEMA Heritage, and they did a nice little story about it. But the same thing, they put the picture of it when it was purple. And I was gone in Vietnam when this came out. I didn't even know that existed. That whole flower piler thing was going on. And I just came back and go, hey, Dan, they made a poster. And that's Deidre Hall, some famous actress. I don't know where, how she got involved with it. <laughs> Larry, I think, did something with that. Bob's famous for 
So it's been in a lot of magazines, been on the cover of international magazines. And that's what it looked like when they found it in Canada for the restoration. And I was just recently honored last, I think last year, uh, it surprised me they had a big veterans get together. We had World War II vets. We had a prisoner of war from World War II and Koreans, Afghan, everybody. And they had a local artist paint that with all the different vets and they gave it to me as a gift. And I'm really proud of that. So that's from the VA. But it's purple as usual. <laughs> So, moving forward, I <coughs> finished the milk truck and now I went to work. Ed Roth hires me and we start building the Druid Princess. While I'm there, I make a friendship with Ed Newton and we had a house where I used to drive all those little cars out in the desert and I fell in love with this 1909 ice truck. It was in this barn. So I get the idea, okay, ice, that's pretty cool. And uh, we, him and I come up with this idea. I love the old, like, Lotus race cars and all the Indy cars and everything. So I'm bound and determined to make a hot rod that looked like a race car that was low to the ground and nobody else was doing any of this stuff. So Ed drew this in 1967. And it was pretty futuristic for its time, I think. These are our original drawings I just found here recently. First it started out over there and I didn't like that at all. When we started pinching everything, it changed its complete dynamic. And I started building, the first set of rear wire wheels I did for it were 24 inches wide. I didn't know where I was going to get tires for it or anything. And the reason they were 24 inches wide when I did the rear suspension, that was as wide as the door was in the garage when it rolled out. It was 100, <laughs> 117 inches wide. Well then, I'm about six months into this and somebody comes over and says, you realize there's a width limitation on the highways? They go, no, really? So I had to narrow the wheels up four inches each. And this is Larry John Garris, and I still held with that old school, that's all, if you look right in front of him, this uh, dovetail, finger jointed maple, and then we put mahogany over it like an old boat, and then fiberglass it. So when they restored it, there isn't a crack in it, there's absolutely no problem, because it's 50 years since I built it. So, I was, that's the T-Buck I drove, this was my parents when I said, narrow the rear end so it would come in and out of the garage. And, uh, Nicky Thompson sold me that motor out of his, he had a double engine dragster that had those two aluminum V8, 215 cubic inches. It's got, you know, uh, lower cams. And it's, he only made those two intake manifolds for the 471 blowers. Mag, Vertex mag. And literally when they restored it and they start firing it up, they found out. I tried to tell everybody when I like drove it out of the Grand National Roadster Show into the parking lot. It's like the world's funnest go-kart. You know, it's 106 inches wide and it's 42 inches tall. You're not going to turn it over and know what you do. So you just have a ball. You just put your foot in it, go out there and go have a... <laughs> So the other unique feature on this was, see where the steering wheel is? It's right in the middle of my private parts. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't get, and I wanted to lay down and I wanted this vertical steering because all these old cars had vertical steering. So I made a tapered pin and tapered receiver so I could just hit it with my hands and pop it out and I'd get out of the car with my steering wheel. Then I'd get back in my steering wheel and hit it and put it back in place. And time and time again, I'd be standing there with the steering wheel and people come, that's not a real car, it hasn't got a steering wheel. You can't drive it, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so this was the Grand National Roadster Show. I built that 27 Touring. It's got full independent suspension, Barone wires, and we did that little car behind it we called Itty Bits and it had a Subaru, two-cylinder motor in it for Jim Babs. So we showed up with the Grand National Roadster Show and caused quite a little stir. Uh, unfortunately, the, the day before the show, they had a huge earthquake in LA and we had to reroute to get down to, up to San Francisco. And this is the first day I drove this. I drove it about 20 miles to this parking lot. Bob Buck, <coughs> Wagner shot these pictures and they're just faded out. But Tom Kelly, again, did the ice sign. Uh, I refused to put it in the magazine because I still hadn't polished the motor, you know, the block and the transmission. Everything else was done. I didn't have any headlights on it yet. And, uh, Dan, by this time you had returned from Vietnam, right? Yes. This, I did, we started it before the frame picture was before I went to Vietnam. When I came back, I finished it in 1970. So this is probably 1970, 71. That's me with the long hair. And, so you probably did a lot of thinking about this car while you were over there. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, the radiator, 
It's all eight inch brass and we heated our, we're trying to figure out how it's going to do that and not have any heat from the wells show up in the polishing. And then the front radiator, because it's got those side cores, I knew we couldn't get that to really work well. So the rear radiator is four inches thick and there's a fan between it. But I needed a water pump and I didn't want to upset that motor with a, having a visual water pump. So while I'm there, I see an armored personnel carrier has got a, like a pump that takes the water out of it, like a boat, a bilge pump. Yeah. So I bagged the bilge pump and I bring it back to Vietnam. <laughs> Along, up in the ceiling in there, there's a little really beautiful light that's all pivoted and everything. That came out of a Phantom F4 jet. And when they restored it, they go, we can't find that light. Where did it come from? I says, from an F4 Phantom jet. So it's not in there now. <laughs> But the U.S. government helped me there. <laughs> so it, was, it traveled around and it was in a, a lot of car shows in Southern or California, that, and then it just disappeared. And Boyd Connington called me about 10 years ago now, and he goes, there's some guy on the phone called me up and says, he thinks he's got your ice truck. He's got, so I said, well, let him give me his phone number. I call him, he goes, hey, man. I'm over here in Fresno. I'm going to make a low rider. And this thing's pretty cool. I want the wheels, but I'm going to cut it up. And they told me I shouldn't. <laughs> I just, no, don't cut it up. <laughs> so I quit shooting in chart, you know, and he immediately made a deal and bought it. So then they restored it. And uh, I think it was 2010. But and they did the same thing. They took the courtesy of putting panel painting on it. And they never had that. It was all just one color but it's happily living its life in the museum now. They, but if I go down there, see I did an opposed coil front end on the, and, all these, and all those upright pieces that all the suspension bolts on, I was going to Compton Junior College. So I surface ground them. So, you know, no need to, but it was, I could do it. So that made it easier when I primed the frame and when they were restoring it, they realized the old thing from the milk truck with every weld on there, I filed and I did my finger because I hadn't still got a, any tools yet. So <clears throat> that's all pH 17.4 stainless, every part of the suspension. And uh, it was a library of love. You see, the, you know, that's the re reproduction, so the, the little light's not in it. And that's the steering wheel that comes out. <laughs> and you, you, get to, you get to adjust there here. <laughs> this is something you, you know, I don't think the safety people would like that too much. <laughs> but, and then, <clears throat> the, uh, like I say, the wheels, I, I ended up making a lot, a lot of Buick wire wheels for a lot of the show cars and hot rods and custom. And that's the first time I got to sit in my truck in 40 some years at the Grand National Roadster Show with Dave. So it was pretty exciting. And then, then the reality is, you know, it's pretty hard to see out the front with a blower and all that, that high up in there, because I'm so low. But when I was building it and driving it around, I really didn't care. So that's the same picture of me. The, uh, it was a lot of fun. But it's all worth it. And it's all worth it at the end because that's what it's all about. It's passion. That's what drove that car to finish. This was taken after they restored it, the old Packard plant, I guess, in Detroit. And what's missing in all these pictures is never has anybody standing beside it, so you don't realize how wide, how low it is. So I say it's a, like a big gold car. That's when they found it in Fresno, it was Blood Alley. <laughs> Why do you name a car Blood Alley? In the red, they shortened it up. They, chop up the headers. Now, this is what I built for Ed. My time at Ed Roth was, you know, it changes your life. Everybody out here knows Ed, Big Daddy Roth. For the guys that worked there, it was Ed, Large Father. <laughs> Large Father taught us, and that's the reason we called him that. You learned every day when you came to work. He, you know, you never knew what was gonna happen, what was gonna take place, and he was just a kind, kindred soul. It just was great to me, and I'll, I miss him every day since he passed. You know, Dan, after you told me that story, I, I talked to my team here at the museum, and I said, I'd like you to call me Large Father from now on. <laughs> and they all ran out of the room and laughed. <laughs>
So this was for the Adams Family TV show. Remember the Munster yeah. coach? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, they got Ed involved and said, okay, so Plymouth gave us that motor, came in a crate, I'm going to Comp Engineering College. We come, Ed Newton had drawn it with these four springs, so it was like an old carriage. So <clears throat> this is us building it. And Ed's business card says, monsters that mean business. Right, right below that, that big daddy Roth. Just imagine going to the bank with your paycheck. It says, Ed Roth, monsters that mean business. He signs a signature at the bottom, and at the end of the last R goes up over Dan Woods, and there's a fly, two flies, and they're pooping on your name. <laughs> now, you know, some people are gonna go, yeah, right, this is a real chair. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's Jim Jacobs, my lifelong friend. He became Pete and Jake's. That's Jake and I working at Ed's shop, building that. And I think, oh. Uh, hey, there's the fly right oh, there. Oh, yeah, there's, uh, didn't realize you got a picture. So that was, you know, that was just his signature, the fly with the poop. This was a letter about, you know, how I put on, you know, he hired me. And then <clears throat> this is Jake and I and Ed, they're talking about the rat things. Tell me about Dirty Doug, because Dirty Doug was part of that group. Was he there when you were there? Oh yeah, Dirty Doug did all the fiberglass work for Big Daddy Rock. And this man was the most fatidious, clean person. He wore a sport coat no matter what, the minute he left the shop. So that's how he got the name Dirty. Only Ed Roth would call somebody that's clean, Dirty Doug. And Dirty Doug painted the last paint job on the Bucciali. He did the wheels and the fenders and everything for me, for Big, for Bill Tishman after Ed had went out of business and everything. So we had an incredible ride. When I finished it, this is, the, I think the third or second, fourth day I'm there, that's the road agent. That's Ed and I bleeding the brakes on the road agent. And, uh, the rear shop was just a jumbled up mess. That's Ed. When Harris Museum was restoring these things, they go, there was a distinct change when you, the Druid Princess happened. He says, the cars that he built, they'd be two inch difference in the tri uh, axle length from front to rear, one side to the other. And they go, you know, because that just didn't care. I mean, honestly, it, you know, it was phenomenal. And everything was filthy, dirty. So I got in there, and he put a big sign at the front of the building that says, Woods and me only in this building. <laughs> and this picture right here, he's holding that baby coffin open. Well, who in the right mind would get a baby coffin and put it in the back of your car? Ed Roth, you know, and that's a story in itself of safer and later time, but I had to go buy that. You just don't show up at a, you know, say, I want a baby car. <laughs> you put a, the fuel tank was in there, moon fuel tank. So I worked my tail off on this, hiding a four barrel carburetor with the injectors on top inside the blower, took the blower out. And it's a brand new crate motor. So put a little rod that came out of the carburetor shaft right through the back of the blower with a pivot on it. Linkage went to that, and went to the Hillborn. I'm all proud, you can't see, you had never known that carburetor was in there. Ed comes in the shop, Woods, I want people to know you did that. I go, Ed, I don't care. No, grabbed a drill and put two half inch holes in the side of the blower so he could get to the, the adjustment screws for the uh, speed and the... Uh, idle air idle and all air. that. And you'll never look back. So we had a lot of fun with that. So that's it in the shop, and that's Jake and I. And we were wearing chrome German helmets. You know, his input was, you know, at the time, you don't even think, World War II just got over 20 years ago. And we're running around in chrome German helmets. That was my 60 Chevy sedan delivery that I put purple suede paint on it, primer, and it had chartreuse metallic roof uh, metal plate and the side panels. And I got kicked out of Yosemite Valley because I was a, Visual distraction. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you gotta wonder who's running this show. So Ed loved all this. So Larry Watson painted it. There's the tank in the back. And we just no sooner got it done, they canceled the, the TV show. So then Ed gets this V6 motor Chevy and decides Ed, uh, Newton drew this Captain Pepe's motorcycle hauler. So that was the next thing I built. And we had a lot of fun with that. Drove it. 
but it ended up in a junkyard for 22 years. They took that back and put some plywood there and chased parts in the junkyard with that. It functioned, it worked fine. And then they found it and restored it. Where is that located now, Dan? Do you know what, who owns that? I think Daryl Roth restored it. You'll see some pictures in a minute. And uh, I can't remember the gentleman that's bought it, but I've heard about it. See, when they restored, this is another point. That's a restoration. You saw what the original car looks like. You know, the Drew Princess have all that crap on it, to put it so. <laughs> So, yeah. and all that filigree's from picture frames. And it's like, you know, you apply it on there and then we fiberglass over it. So, he was larger than life and he was a lot of fun. How many years did you work for Ed Roth, Dan? Uh, before I went to Vietnam, I think two and a half, and then I came back to Vietnam and was always with him, and, but you know, I didn't get paid from that point on. So actually around two, two and a half years yeah. old. And you can see all of us, you know, they've got a whole section of the book on me and Jake. And uh, when Pat McGonnell did the article, we found the original pictures. But I made all those spring cups and the front rear and everything, all at Compton Junior College. And I don't know if you've seen the show called Straight Out of Compton. With all, you know, well, you're looking at somebody straight out of Compton. <laughs> and, you know, it doesn't fit. They go, you don't look black, Mr. Woods. <laughs> Well, we weren't. So you can see the offset in that frame here. We put the motor on one side, the rear end. I had one axle that was 12 inches long and another one was 52 inches long. And it was a, a fun project. And about this time, Dirty Duck, I mean Dirty, Von Dutch shows up. Dirty Dutch was there all the time. He showed up riding a motorcycle and it was a Harley XA, the Experimental Army, which is shaft driven. And he's put a Volkswagen motor in it. And he did a, one of the better things that Dirty Doug ever did. When you walked up, you thought maybe it was a BMW bike because of the posed cylinders and it had a Honda tank on it. And he made the VW emblem fit just perfect in it. And he comes riding in there at lunchtime. Ed comes out, says, I gotta have that. Dutch says, no, no. They get an argument over it. Ultimately, Ed ended up with it. And that's what got Ed started with the bikes. And while I was there, they filmed that movie, uh, I'm losing my mind, but with Henry Fonda, the famous motorcycle, easy rider. Easy rider. Ah. So I got that van, so I got to take Henry Fonda and Ed, and we went to the Hells Angel Ranch in San Bernardino one night. That was an experience. <laughs> <laughs> the Angel, they started coming to the shop constantly. Well, Ed had a contract with for models, and it wasn't doing his image a lot of good having the Hells Angel being part of his thing. So that was ultimately what brought this all down. So. And this is his, he, he got up, he was bound to turn, once he got that motorcycle, that these three-wheelers were going to work. So <clears throat> we did that in the back shop, Dirty Doug and I, and Ed, I built a frame and, you know, put that V8 in there, one of those aluminum motors. And, uh, I think somebody asked on the previous slide if that was a Triumph motor, Dan, do you remember? The motorcycle? Yes, it was. It was a Triumph. When we were building it, we were going to put an aerial on it because Fuller, one of the gentlemen that worked there, Crazy Fuller, we called him, you know, his middle name was Ariel because his dad loved it. So we were going to put an aerial on the back of it. We <laughs> didn't do that. So then, while I was there, Ed came up with this God's garage. Now, how far, you know, that's Moses on the mound. Instead of the Bible, he's got, or the flat, it's got the motor manual and he's holding up a crescent wrench. <laughs> <laughs> so we showed up at the car show with that. And that wasn't a big hit. <laughs> As far as I know, this is the biggest thing that Ed Roth ever pinstriped, and he did this for me as a favor. It's in a casino called Blood, the Blood something, Bucket of Blood in Carson City, Nevada. And all that gold leaf, I forget how much gold leaf we put on that, but he did all that gold leaf and all that striping on that fire wagon as a favor to me. And, you know, that's pretty amazing. People don't even know he did that stuff. And that's a little trivia I got, you know, my dear lifelong friend's Larry Wood, and he does all the Mattel Hot Wheels. So <clears throat> my Early Times Car Club, we did the Early Times one, and then we did one for Rapid Transit, and we put a friend of ours phone number on it. He had to change his phone number. He got so <laughs> many phone calls from kids, they were calling <laughs> night and day. So, and then Rod Powell, which, you know, he's got a thing in here, Rod painted this, and because I'm a fanatic, we put, instead of rivets, I got buttonhead Allens in the RF. 
That sits behind my desk. I'm very proud of that. So that's my rat. He's with me. You're, when you're, you're raised with the rat, you're going to be the rat. You're going to end up dying with the rat. Ed's tombstone, we, he made it back, I don't think it was 1972. And it says, Ed Big Daddy Roth, one a few, lost a few. And it's got the rat all carved in it. And then he, when he got back into the Mormon church, seriously, I don't know, I think it, it was Ed Brucker's Cards of Stars, but they never did put it on the casket. So this is my tea bucket. We did all these main manks, but that's the corner up there at the early times, roads around it. And I drove this car. This is the one I traded the milk truck for. I put my steering wheel in it, changed the Buick wire wheels in the back. It had drum brakes in the rear, no front brakes. And I drove that car, rain or shine, for four years. And it was, I loved it. You know, you know, we just had a ball in the early times. Candy red. Don Oaks originally cut the body down. So I got a 15 body, cut it, made a mold, and started selling those bodies. Never had a problem with those spindle mounts. A lot of people ask, you know, can you run those spindle mounts on the street with the side load, but you never had any trouble with that. Nope. Not at all. But it teaches you how to drive because you're going down a freeway and all of a sudden you push on the brakes and you got drum brakes, no front brakes, and one wheel locks, I'm doing 360s. Yeah. <laughs> so to this day, you're, you know, it's like an automatic instant everything. It just comes in play. And this was funnier than heck. I think it was Carcraft Magazine got that Buick whatever special, and they want, they want to go up to uh, Griffith Park and test, have us test drive it. So they brought Jake and me and Roger Brinkley, and I don't remember, but to test drive their car. Well, you don't get a bunch of hot rodders to test drive a car. <laughs> so I was the second one in, and I went through this corner and blew off all the hubcaps. They first rolled the tires off that way, then the, the guy that was the magazine sub editor was in the back seat he pulled the side panel of the interior off trying to hold on and he said, well you guys have done just fine thank you for everything and leave <laughs> this is the early times car club and it was in a time there was the roadsters you know only and we were like the rat think is the counterculture of mickey mouse well the early times had a reputation of being the counter cunt of the roadsters of LA. So we, I, I was a driving force and Jake and I, we'd go to the roadster meets and just make them mad because we'd show up with chrome German helmets, beards, long hair, and <laughs> instead of white pants and a red shirt that said roadsters on it. So we started putting on these picnics. And these three cars, I did that 27 touring and I just was fortunate enough, of two, three weeks ago, I hadn't seen that car in 28 years, and I got to take my daughter and my granddaughter and ride in it for 27. This is the first car I did. It's a post quote front end that I got paid for, for you know, as starting out my business. I was, and my parents, that's the same place I built those cars in Paramount. I took over the carport and the garage. <laughs> they didn't say a word, and I built that tea bucket for a kid. And we finished it late in the afternoon on a Wednesday, early evening. My dad, he used to tell everybody, I don't know where all my gas is going for my lawnmower. Thing burns up three, four gallons a week. You know, so we dumped the gas, as dad and mom, into the tea bucket. It, I did the transmission, I built the motor, I did everything on that car. We went around the block, my mom sewed up some pads and he drove it to Peoria, Illinois for the first uh, street rod nationals and back on an untested car. And we were really excited because it didn't have a bit of problems. Did you ever wish you were a fly on the wall when your mom and dad were talking to oh, relatives yeah, sure. on the phone? <laughs> you, my dad, but now that, you know, you'll see pictures of me here shortly, and I'll tell you that story when it comes up. It was quite hilarious. So this is my tea bucket. I was, this was while I was working on the uh, ice truck. We were doing that wooden part. I was at J and J chassis after school. When I was going to Long Beach State College. Uh, get my degree, I was going to be an auto shop teacher. I thought this would be great. I got this, you know, everything going. I want to help these kids out. i am be an auto shop teacher. Well, meantime, I traded Reisner. He starts California show cars. I'm working straight 24 hours, you know, in a row, two days, and get 1000 bucks back in the 1970s for getting these cars done for the shows. So my 
ex-wife back then says, you know, this is stupid. Teachers don't make this kind of money. You should stay with the cars. <laughs> so this gentleman came to me, uh, Bob Reed, and I built uh, at least 15 cars from over the years. But this is the butcher truck, and that was the first full independent chat. I made the spindles and everything. And the reason I was using PH 17 for stainless, which is not the easiest stuff to use, because I could buy it cheap. There was a scrapyard over there, and they had a lot of it. So I made the spindles and everything, all the suspension, and that got me started on this obsession with stainless steel. So that car, that's me and Steve Davis, and all these people, and you see the front suspension, there's tapered spindles, and brawny wire wheels, I had a passion for them, so I put a brownies on almost everything I built, and we built that stepside pickup. Dave Zuchel built a 500 and some inch motor back then, and I hid the air conditioning and all that underneath so you couldn't see the drive for it. And, uh, quick story on that, gentleman wanted to change his oil, had the oil can sitting on the seat, pulled up to his garage door, obviously that motor had some rump to it, and you know, so him it fell on the floor, he gets in, puts it in gear, puts on the brake. Well, the brake, the oil can had laid on top of the gas pedal. So the harder he pushed the brake, the faster the motor went. So now it's locked, doing a line lock at his garage door. <laughs> Doors open. When it launched, it went through the back into the swimming pool. <laughs> I did this. This is a 426. Keith Black built this motor. And uh, the gentleman came to me. That's uh, out of sync. This is back to the butcher truck. It's an 09 Ford. Every weld on it was you know, done with no bondo. It was all ground. And that car was just in a show in Cleveland three months ago. Hasn't been painted, hasn't been touched. Boyd Coddington, three weeks before he died, he always wanted that car. So he got Bob Reed to finally sell it. The gentleman I built it for, got to Boyd's shop, and then Boyd died. So they had to get it back. This is me and my car line. Junior, Herschel Conway Jr. bought that. It was the first car him and his wife bought. I bought it from Junior. And I drove that to college and I was really excited about it. And one night I was coming back from Tom Hanna's. We were working on this aluminum project. And some lady got on the freeway in a muscle car drunk and hit me at 130 miles an hour. And I'm seeing the next picture. It didn't do me or the truck any good. So that's the, the, the cable they used to put down the freeway. And I came out the passenger door and went down the freeway 160 feet without the truck. Oh my God. So I came to laying on the freeway and I, I made it from Vietnam. I'm going to get run over on the 605 freeway. <laughs> so where this story's going, the magazine comes to the hospital. I do an article about the safety of brakes and cars. And you know, I, over here I talk about we need, you're doing steering, you need to have your welds, magnaflux, and everything. Well, we didn't realize you aren't allowed to take pictures of people in hospital. So Tom McMullen got sued and had to pay 250 grand for publishing that picture of me in the hospital. But he said it was worth every dime. Because <laughs> he's a hot rider. This was like 1973. And then Larry Wood drew this up, you know, when I was in the hospital. These are all, Boyd caught me, everybody that's anybody signed it. And uh, I'm quite proud of that too. Fat Jack. And then I started having to go all over the you know, world. They were having me do interviews and stuff. So this was Custom Car Magazine. And if you don't know about Custom Car Magazine, in Europe, topless women and that nudity is very common. So the magazine comes out with me in it, and there's a topless woman in the front. My two eight and 10 year old daughters are going to a Christian school. They show up at school to share their dad in the magazine. <laughs> Didn't go over real big with the principal and the you know, pastor or anybody else. Dad's sending his children to school with boobs on the front. <laughs> so this, this was an interview for the magazine about all the stuff we did. This was just working on the way. So I had this beard and long hair for a long time. And this magazine came out, I think in the 2008 or something. Was that the Orbitron? Pardon? Was that the Orbitron? Yeah. You, you see, you know, it, it, it pretty much, the guy did a really good job. And <coughs> it shows all the different show cars of the 60s and 70s. And you have to understand that whole period of time, <laughs> that's everybody in the 
you know, George Barris, Joe Balon, uh, uh, sorry, you know, Chuck Miller, everybody's in here. For me to be included, I was quite proud that, you know, I got put in that group of people. That's me down there. And uh, so these show cars were to draw people to the show. They weren't really cars. You know, you, know, you want to talk about something that makes you nervous? That's a Merlin. And everything I built worked. So I get in this thing. They had a guy come over from you know, the aircraft, get this thing fired up. I pull out, you know, whop. And that's all, and, you know, that was the end of that. I said, I'm not that crazy that I'm going to make this thing go down the road any more than just slow. And then I never started it again. <laughs> but, you know, there's not a whole a lot of people say that, but a three wheel motorcycle with a Merlin in it. And this, that was D. Tommaso, because you know, your motor collection here. <laughs> Dean Moon was my dear friend, and you get these motors donated. So we got the D. Tomaso motor. It was a famous restaurant in town that closed, had been there since the early 1920s in LA, called the Silver Saddle Inn. So that stagecoach was out front, so we built stage fright. And you see my Buick wire wheels on the four corners, they're 20 inches wide, and a post coil front end with it laid back this way. And that was my dear friend from the early times. And this one was called the Martian Spider. I did that during Easter break when I was going along the state built the frame and everything, and Ed drew it, it looks like a, what now is a stealth bomber. Well, Bob Larry and his never wisdom to get people to come to car shows, gets Miss America to sit in there to sh prior to the show opening, and I'm there, and he says, Dan, disenable that thing so it won't open. Why, just do that, okay. Next thing I know, he's telling everybody there's only so much oxygen in this thing, and she's gonna suffocate. So now we got news media up the gazoo coming to the show. And you know, at the point where they got their chainsaws out is when I finally turned on it and said, I'm not going to go any further with this Bob. <laughs> so great story on that. And then right in the very, very front, there's this crazy thing. I was at the dentist and it held his lights. And I go, I got to have that. So that's what's holding that. The front looks like a radar. That's the frame for it. And that's a dual turbocharged World War II tank motor that ran on gas, and it looks just like the Ford dual overhead cam Ford motor. I think they just took that design and the plant and just made it smaller. Things massive. And it shook the ground when we started it. That's it there. You see what I'm saying about the cams and everything? So this is Bob Reisner. There, yeah, that thing right there is from the dentist office. <laughs> <With that. laughs> So I made all those A-arms and everything. And we built the barbershop car at the same time. We were building cars. Then Pink Panther gets a hold of us. You know, for the TV show, Reisner got two Tornado front-wheel drive motors given to him. So that's what's in this, is a Tornado. So I built the chassis and made it so it would function. And then they had Joe Bale on. Uh, half a dozen of us doing the body work. And I literally had five gallons of Bondo with one of those mixers that you mix uh, paint with, mixing up five gallons of Bondo with a hard, much harder we could get in it. And we were spreading Bondo on that thing, you know, at the end to get it done. And they just restored that. It. It's in the same museum of my truck. That's the restoration photographs. And Jay Leno did a, a show about this here a few months ago. They called me up. So what people, when they see these, you don't understand the mechanical part to make that steer and drive and everything else. It wasn't easy, but I loved the challenge. This was one of my favorite front projects. Uh, Red Fox, the TV show Sanford and Son. So this is the Red Fox record. So <clears throat> we started on it. And if you look in that blue picture right there, there's a handle sticking up. Well, that's hooked up to a hydraulic cylinder. And what I did, I found an aircraft surplus. And you turn the handle left and push it, and you go left. You turn it to the right, pull back, and you go right. So it was hydraulic steering. Well, I'd been up, I built that whole rear system back there and all that chrome in 30 some hours. And the two long runners came from LaFell to me and they were on that new X1 bomber, that really wild looking thing. It had the big square plates on the back of it. They were titanium. So I was dead tired and I was running a bandsaw and I cut my finger off. It's laying on the ground. So I pick it up and I run over to Richard Graves and I go, hey Richard, we need to go to the hospital. He goes, why? And I held my finger and his blood goes like that and he fainted. <laughs> I go, this isn't good. <laughs> so I got a lot of memories about that truck. They sewed my finger on, it's working fine. <laughs> uh, 
So I think they told me, I think they're restoring that. So now we move up to the Roach coach. Ed Newton knew Stan Peterson. And if you're not familiar with Roach Studios, there was a transitional period when the screen shirts, you know, like we're all wearing now all this silk screen, wasn't available. So they got a patent and they did iron on it. And you would go to the mall and you would pick out your, they franchised it, your, your iron on deep and bring your own t-shirt or they would sell you one there. And they would iron on. So that was their catalog and they wanted to have a roach. So they enlisted Ed Newton to draw it. And you'll see the next picture. It originally was supposed to look like that. And Ed and I got to go, that ain't working. So I bought two big pieces of styrofoam. And this is really funny. You know, and they go, what are you going to use it for? I'm building a cockroach. Yeah, right. <laughs> so then, you know, it's got a double bubble for eyes. So I talked to Ed. And I see that metal ring? I made these metal rings with that thing down the center, all radius so it wouldn't hurt. And I go to the largest producer of bubbles in the world, Swedlow Corporation, it just happened to be, because I was born and raised in that Apollo spacecraft, all that. So it's, you have to have a, a clearance from the government to even go in the building. So I knock, hi, I'm Dan Woods. I need to make some eyeballs for a cockroach. You know, they're going, yeah, right. So when I showed them what was going on, they, they loved the whole idea. So they got me a clearance, and three days later, I show up, and you know what we did, and <laughs> you heat it up, and then you, I put that string across there so we could make, they'd never done double bubbles, but we blew them until they both touched. So this is, we're carving the thing out, we got these big styrofoam pieces, and then we put uh, the sonolite. And I'd come home in the evening, well, how was your day? Well, it was fine, but I was really tired of block sanding inside these legs on this cockroach. And see that split tail? That is a female cockroach. Everybody needs to know that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the first day I got, you know, Andy Granatelli gave me a dual overhead cam Ford motor for it. Uh, Dan Gurney gave me the, his uprights in the front and his shocks and the LG 6000 transmission. And it's all 4130. And that tank in the middle, in fact, they just asked me about it. That's out of the Apollo spacecraft. It's probably a $150,000 titanium tank. So it was all state of the art underneath. Everything was right, done right. And we rolled it out in the street in Los Angeles. It just started having helicopter police. They landed it in that field over there. They couldn't figure out what the heck that was from the sky. <laughs> and this was the first pictures when it was done. I think they shot them in Ohio or something. And, uh, it was pretty wild. And I, those wheels I made in the mill, they're like, they look like BBSs, but they're not. Like I said, these are Dan Gurney uprights. I made all the suspension, the frame. I was quite proud of it, even though it's a cockroach. And Larry was just telling me, he made those tubes that said Raid on them. He just told us that when he was just showing it. And this is another funny story. See this young lady? 25 years after I built that car, I'm at a dinner with some people. And they were all surfers and people in Newport Beach. And this, gentleman that put the party, there was his girlfriend sitting across from me. And I kept looking at her, looking at her. And I, excuse me, this is going to be the stupidest question any human being has ever asked me if it's not true. So don't be offended. Don't think I'm doing anything here. Did you ever have your picture taken next to a giant cockroach? <laughs> <laughs> she gets this big grin on her face. She goes, yeah. I go, how do you know that? I go, well, I got, it. you know, they sent me these pictures. She said, that's my prom dress. That was the first modeling job I ever got. My dad took me there. So, you know, small world. <laughs> I did, we did a lot of restorations. This is Frank Fowler. I did this 32 Ford with a, uh, I think it had a Model B in it with a General Jumbo wheels on it for Jimmy Kluger. This is a 27. This really upset the Model T world. I found that body in Big Bear. It's aluminum. They only made like four of them. And I made a hot rod out of it. <laughs> they going, you shouldn't do that, Dan. <laughs> yeah, this was my favorite tea bucket. After, this is after it got sold. When I finished it, it was, uh, it's got a Gurney Eagle in it. It's a real Gurney Eagle. You know, the thing, when I delivered it, I was going through Jackrabbit Pass at 122 miles an hour with a horse chasing me. And I realized that's a 1919 windshield. Yeah. The glass is held in there about a quarter inch on all the sides. 
<laughs> and I got two little rods that are quarter inch diameter with bolts up there holding this. I can't even imagine what the wind load was on this thing. So that's when I backed out of the throttle. But it's still being shown. That's all LA Roadster. He takes it every year. Packing all the, I made the uprights instead of Jaguar in. They're all custom made uprights, Ronnie wires. Jim Basby did that radiator instead of the regular flat. So this is over 45 years since I built it, and they took these pictures. That's what it looked like when I finished it. It was brown. Yeah, very proud of that one. It was really a nice car. And I spent at least a month polishing those Weber carburetors by hand, because that's what I like to do. And that would you know, radius anything. And this is a T-flat 426 Hemi in a T-bucket, full fender. This gentleman's fame. His money came from uh, making napalm. And this, Elvis Presley, you get a phone call. I never knew who was going to call me. I, I worked for everybody. I get a phone call and says, hi, I'm with you know, Elvis Presley. He would like to come meet you, come to your shop. But you know, it's only one condition. You can't tell a soul. If anybody's there, when the limousine pulls up, he's not going to get out. You know, so I couldn't tell my wife, couldn't tell anybody. So all of a sudden, one day, black limousine pulls up. They didn't call me in advance or anything. And he opened the door and Elvis came in and we spent four hours in my shop, he, really nice. And he had me build that for his drummer as a surprise. So that was a good story. I built, I, I don't even know how many of them. That's a little wine truck I built for a friend of mine from high school. It was just a sea cab. One of the key buckets with my post quote front end. A lot of people tried to do that. And then that's the Mosier motor. I was just telling everybody, you know, this is Tom McMullen. And Tom and I were dear friends since he, he first came to California. He ended up owning Street Rider magazine and A, E, and E choppers when the hot, all that you know, stuff was going on. So I had a lot of fun building that. And I built this for Hearst Corporation. It's got a four cylinder pinnel in it. I don't know, I never knew, found out why they, what they did with it. Just, I finished it, I saw it in these ads, and that was the end of it. This was my last shot before I moved into the big building. This was a, about 12,000 feet. I had 4,000 foot building and I had a small, you know, it was just too many cars going on at once. That's at Woody. It, we restored a, you know, during all this, I was building hot rods and you can see them on the wall, Model T chassis, Model A's, but I kept the idea that I didn't care how, even else, whoever came to my door, if that gentleman right there was in front of you, his car came out first. You know, there was never, any mindset that, well, just because this guy's got money or he's famous, he's going to do anything ahead of anybody else. So there was always a waiting list. And I found out, you know, when it got up to about a year and a half, they were selling faces in my line to get a car built. I said, that ain't going to work. So this was my, uh, anyhow, the, the go last shop I had was 30,000 square feet. We had Bizzarinis, we had Porsches, and that's when I got burned out. I just quit right there. You know, they, it was just insane. And, I couldn't even give my wife $600 a month, I mean a week, you know, to make groceries and stuff. Everybody was getting paid, my employees and everything, and I'm there 20 hours a day and my daughters are growing up. So the passion was still there to build the cars, but you know, it overwhelms you. This is a, I took a Jaguar in and used Corvette outlets and I put everything on top so there's no lower anything. It doesn't look good, you know, so I never did fulfill it, but you know, it was just an idea. But you won't see that every day. I did this for Anheuser-Busch. And I made this body, I'll show you here in the next picture. That car got stolen and pushed off of a cliff in Palos Verdes. This week, you know, the Bugatti Veyron, well, Bob Reisner, the gentleman I told you, California show cars, bought the Bugatti name from the Bugatti family. Got Link Continental, and he got Joe Borth, and California Metal Shaping to make this aluminum body over a Lincoln Continental chassis and was gonna revitalize the Bugatti. So I helped him for, but it was just uglier sin, so I couldn't put my name on it. <laughs> And everybody's heard about the Bosley Hair Restoration Company. Yeah. They've got ads everywhere. Well, I took that Bentley. They don't stop on hills and everything. I put disc brakes on it, restored it for Bosley. That, when I was working for Bill Tishman, that was after I'd quit. This was the first gullwing in the United States, or part of the world, that went down to the bare frame. Because the gentleman I did it for, his son had a powder painting company. So we powder painted the birdcage frame and all the pieces so that the Mercedes Club was coming to my hot rod shop to watch us build this thing, but then they found out hot rods were pretty cool. 
so that sort of brought us all together, and you know, the Europeans against that. And uh, sold that car to the president of Rockwell International for 50 grand. Everybody thought we'd cut a fat hog. <laughs> what do you think it's worth now? <laughs> Completely 100 point restoration. And put Barani wires on a Pantera. You know, uh, it was uh, just tons of stuff we did over the years. Tom Kelly, uh, T. Tommaso. 32, I did so many, hot, and I didn't take pictures, unfortunately, but we did so many 32s, 34s, Model A's. I did a 32 uh, Victoria for Bill Block in Nail and Quaker Industries. And originally, little John Batera's partner in Kenosha, Wisconsin, had done all the work in it, and he was way above little John. And little John would always admit it. He was an aircraft. He loved everything. So they made everything in that vehicle work on vacuum. The windows, everything was vacuum operated. So they were trying to go to the street run nationals from Wisconsin, something failed and it was always a problem. So they had it shipped to me. So I wasn't involved, but what it had was, it was silver and black. And all the windows in that vehicle were that, where you can look at them, look chrome, but you could see out when the difference in the light is inside now. Well, I learned a valuable <coughs> lesson. After working on the car for five months, I did a stainless floor pan, put all the independent suspension on it red leather interior and everything, and then change it to power windows, power everything. I'm going down the 405 freeway to put it in the 747 to fly it back home. Dennis Roth, Roth's son, we were working for him at the time. And all of a sudden it got early evening and the light outside, because he'd been in the shop the whole time, so the light was never. All of a sudden, instead of seeing the freeway and all that, I see Dan Woods. I go, Wait a minute, that isn't right. Turn to the right, there's Dan Woods, there's Dan Woods. It turned into a mirror. I'm driving at 62 miles an hour, 65, in a box of glass, mirror. Can't see out anywhere, anyway. Dennis said I just went across four lanes. People were scattering everywhere <laughs> so I could get the side windows down and get my head out. That'll get your heart pumping. That'll get your attention. So this is uh, an English magazine that came and I took them around. I should read them, got this in here. That's an Alvis I did that won Pebble Beach, a 39 Alvis. This is a ZZ Top car, and we built that at Don Thielen's. And so we went to the Queen Mary in Long Beach and to shoot it, and they go, have you got permission? Oh yeah, who from? And they go, oh, sir so-and-so. And they go, huh? So by the time they got up there and found out we didn't have permission, we got the pictures. So these were the first pictures ever taken of the Eliminator, you know, months before it ever came out in public. And to this day, it's probably the most notarized car and that's Larry Woods Nash from Hot Wheels. <clears throat> it's a got a late model everything started this whole trend. I did this for Jimmy Pluger. Everything on it's black, every piece of it. It's a phaeton. And then they did the Henry High Rise and they call me Dan Forrest. <laughs> got, And we did the, while I just, I was in the early times, one of the guys in the early times, Dick Knudsen, he wanted to have like an ice truck, but different. So he put the, you know, the two blowers on it and it was all bondoed. We, did, we built that in less than five months and they just restored it. Bob Schoenhoven had it for years and showed it all over the country. So that's it restored. And I, my shop, I put tile on the walls. I painted everything pinstriped it all, all the pipes were color coded for the water, everything in 1972. So when they brought the Long Beach Grand Prix, all the people, the Grand Prix teams came to see my shop. They'd heard about it, they couldn't believe anybody was that, you know, whatever. And you see the <laughs> chassis all, I would run tea bucket chassis. This body came about because I was taking, when I was getting my degree, industrial arts, I had a plastics class. And during Easter break, we were supposed to make a part, a mold, and a piece out of the mold. So I built that in a week. And so they, you know, unfortunately, they didn't know what to do. So they put me in the front office for the, the dean. That's Mark Morton, the same gentleman that did the Hop Up magazine. So built, and this is really funny. Bob Larrabee and his Neville Sile to get promotion of these car shows. I don't know if people know who Bob Larrabee is, but <clears throat> Jimmy Hoffa supposedly got buried in cement when he got assassinated or whatever, he came up missing. So he says, Woods, we're gonna build the Mafia Mixer. 
tribute to Jimmy <laughs> Hoffa. So, next picture. I spent five months working my tail off. I put, there's two, two Jaguar ends under that. I put the, you know, made the, the six wheeled Terrell was out, so I had the big front wheels on it. I took an axle and laid it down sideways. A lot of innovation in it. And that stainless drum, you know, when you start welding stainless, it wants to warp, but I was bound to turn. So that was a whole nother can of worms. But I got it done, and you, know, you can see, it's the Mafia mixer. <laughs> so I drove it to Anaheim Car Show the very first time down the 605 freeway in LA, like nine o'clock at night. And they're going, when I came off the freeway, the cops pulled over and go, you know, you're probably going to get shot with, <laughs> sir. <laughs> I never heard anything about it, so. And then the president of Volvo was retiring, and they just came out with an aluminum V6 motor. It was one of the first production V6 uh, aluminum motors. They called me up, and they gave me four days to come up with something with that motor to give to him for his retirement. So after they leave, we're trying to figure out something. So those are go-kart wheels. It's all in one. I build out the base and everything. And see those three? There's six of those. It holds wine bottles. Sealed it up so you can put ice in it. And then down there's the cam bearing. It's got the corkscrew in it. And then that top plate they engraved to Bob Sinclair. <laughs> so this letter they sent me, it's really funny. It's the next picture. It says, there's an old saying, in fact, that getting what you pay for seems to hold true. And then he said he's totally overread on when they gave it to him, got on his hands and knees, polished, pointed underneath and yelled, look at the welds, they're fantastic, and it's even got upholstery. <laughs> so now about, I want to say a year ago, uh, Road and Track had an article about this thing surfaced somewhere, and they go, we don't know what the heck this thing is, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> George Barris built that for parades for the Tasty Freeze Corporation, but it wouldn't work. So I straightened it all out so it could go down and not boil and have trouble. Those are DC-3 wheels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. This was the last candy red paint job Larry Watson painted. He did it as a favor for me. I lowered his brother's truck. He painted that. That was way after he quit painting. Now, Back, I told you earlier on about my father. He was born in 1895 when I was adopted. So <clears throat> the whole time I had that beard and long hair, when I had the hot rod shop, this is true, I'm on magazine covers all over the world. He would come and eat lunch with the guys. And one day he's sitting there with him and he goes, you know, I wish Dan would get a job. <laughs> <laughs> His attitude was, you know, what I was doing was too much fun and it shouldn't be happening. So then he used to bug, when are you going to cut here? When are you going to cut? So on his 90th birthday, I went to the barber and had all that cut off. I mean, it shaved everything. And he was in tears, and it made me so happy because he, he only lived about six months after I got rid of it. But you can see my boots. I had a Savile Row suit, and I had this gentleman make these boots. They're muckle ups, that's Fox. You know, and I'd show up at these events, and you know, everybody just couldn't figure what the heck's going on here. <laughs> I was the first person in the world to put a Vegas steering box in something. Now, you know, I, I, I need to call Mullins and then people will get some revenue from doing this. <laughs> this is the Booch Alley here at the museum. I'm very lucky that I got to spend so much time in that. And with Bill, Mr. Tishman, he changed my life forever. Because I went from building hot rods and not making any money to working on million, billion dollar homes and doing okay. So he was a construction person. He built the World Trade Center. Tishman Corporation built some of the biggest projects in America. And that was a tribute to, he called it Tishman University. And it taught him so many things. Because when you're building a car, you already know, there's, every time you turn a corner, there's something new. Oh, I forgot to put this, and I should have done that ahead of time, so you got to backtrack. And early this morning, we did about a 45-minute long talk just about the Bucciali. So if you see our website, you know, stay tuned. We'll get that posted. If you want to learn more about that particular car, that'll be a lot of fun. Is everybody hanging in there okay? We're a little bit past our time. We, I, we usually... Done. Okay, we'll keep trucking then. I don't know what that means. So this is the boot. I used to have to take it up the ridge route when it was hot days, and I was just fixing it. This is a 39 Alvis that we did for Pebble Beach. You know, because I'm anal, and I want to impress the judges, when we were doing this thing, I was bound to determine that they could take a straw and stick it in the radiator and drink the water. 
So we put everything on it was perfect. And you know, we gave them straws and they were hesitant, but it had distilled water in it and you could suck the water out of it. So <laughs> it was as perfect as perfect could be. You know, I, you know, we, I restored cars, I built cars, worked on a Bugatti Verona, I mean, a Atlantic that, this is Mr. Tishman, I drove that all over LA. It's got a supercharger on it, bottom of the line is falling. You know, restored Ferraris for Junior. That's my lifelong friend, Junior Conway. We've won so many Ferrari shows and our, we did, there's only three narts in the world and we did two of them. And this is my, I, you can see what year, 1980, anyhow. That's what I wanted to build and I never got to finish it. I wanted to use either a Honda or some front wheel drive and turn it around and have it back there and then have the curved dash hot rod. Nobody's ever done that. No, that didn't happen. This, I was, a gentleman came to me, I started it, worked on it, almost 80% done. He just came and said, I don't know anything about cars, I just finished that uh, country butcher truck. He says, you build your dream truck. So it's got all independent, all stainless, Gurney Eagle uprights, Cobra motor, you know, and it's 80% done and it just surfaced after 47 years. I just saw pictures of it about three months ago. So I'm hoping we can get somebody to finish it because it needs to get done. This is the this is pieces of it, like all that front suspension, that's Gurney Eagle. It's all in Temkin bearings, not bushings. You know, as usual, every weld's ground. It's got a post coil, I made all that. This is all done at my mom's garage in 1970. Those torsion bars go through the rear, those rear, and so they can, Pivot, there's six bearings in there, so you don't have to look at this big long torsion bar. And all this is about passion. I keep saying that over and over. You know, that's what drives you when it's three o'clock in the morning, you're dead tired, and you want to get that final little bracket ground and made correct. I made those uprights at, <coughs> out of 4130. You'll see it when it's done, there's plates that fill in that. This is the way it showed up here recently. Where the frame, where those brackets go in the frame right there, that's all lead. It's all leaded on there. It's all teak, the whole entire body. It's not flat, it's shaped like a barrel. All those pieces that look all molded, that's all hand filed. Cut out with a cut, uh, just a torch. I'm really happy to see it. it's still in existence. I just like to see, and you don't realize how small it is until you see somebody coming out of it. There's no traction bars, the way I built that marina. There's nothing going forward, front end, it's just hanging there. And it works, it's driving, it, they drive it. And it came out of the garage. You see the body there, the teeth. That's what I look like, that was a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody should look like this, right? <laughs> and I'll go back to this is all large father's fault, you know, problem. You know, we, we had no humility. It didn't matter. You just, you know, people, and I have these two little cute girls in their frifty dresses, and I'm running around looking like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a fun deal. <laughs> that, I, they took, my friend was a surf photographer, so we took these pictures the morning I went to the barber shop. That was the last day I had my beard and long hair for my dad. That's the picture we should have used for your promo card. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, the same gentleman I built that brown tea bucket with the Gurney Eagle on it came back and we decided we're going to build four and five thousands were a big deal. So we're going to build a tea bucket for the street, four and five thousand. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? Even to this day. Anybody here wouldn't mind having that to run down the road in? So we started in on it. Art Christman built the motor. It's got a 671 blown motor. I wanted to have automatic, so we used the Tempest out of the, you know, it was in the back, it was a big deal. So the torque converter was right there in the rear of it. And uh, we were about 80% done when his wife found out about it. <laughs> and, you know, they're multi hundreds of millions of dollars, and she wasn't pleased that Bill was going to be driving around in a 180 mile an hour car on the street. So the, pull, the plug got pulled, and all it really needed was wire, the body, and the wing made. You see, we didn't do the radiators, I put them in the front, you'll see here in a minute. 
and that car completely disappeared boyd conning and just left work i was building all his chassis and he was working in his home garage i built the chassis for him and he built the cars and i go to his house one afternoon and this thing's sitting in his driveway he goes woods this is that car you did and i go no kidding so i made all that rear end all that frame 4130 i made the front spindles out of 4130 and the radiator the brass radiator is 3 8 inch brass milled to, with fins in it the actual radiator is where your feet are and the wire runs through the frame and back out the other way through the frame and uh, i'd love to see that car get done but i don't know where it is now see the radiator see those fins on the side that's all done with a hand on the mill i emigrated i did all that it's all worth it it's all worth it at the end so and this i did a full monocoque from front that's a piece of 10 gauge steel from the back to the front welded to the 32 rails so you don't have any, you know, and then the motor mount is in that center picture. And then the front, I took a big 13 inch drop axle. See that axle? 13 inches of drop, leaned it way back, and then put these, just like the old wishbones, go to a pivot point underneath the bottom and then these curl of shocks. I did that for one of the early times members, way after I quit building hot rods. Don't know what happened to that one. But it was low and you couldn't, you could take it out, drag it behind a ski boat. It would have just popped along the water. You could take it out in the snow because there was nothing in there either. <laughs> and when I started doing the houses, I had company trucks. So all those stainless uprights and everything was way too nice for a shop truck. But once you start doing this, it becomes a sickness. <laughs> and where I'm at now, they really think I'm sick because Every six months, I have a 3,000 foot metal building. I go out and I wax the building. <laughs> <laughs> this was, I don't, if it goes here in Nebraska, I don't know, but all the job sites in California, it was, it was a big rage on in the 2000s and early 2000s about my pickup truck's bigger and better than your pickup truck. <laughs> Guess who won? <laughs> That's, you know, and this is, your wife says, you're not doing this. And I had a driver at the time, you know, and he had the license to drive this. So we pulled up in front of the house the day I got it. She says, I'm going to kill you, Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and as you can see, the fifth wheel is long gone. You know, I mean, I covered, I made this stainless steel bed. So it just set right over the fifth wheel. And we put 11, because the sleeper and everything, I put 11 people in there, we had to go to lunch. <laughs> Open the door, 11 guys would come out. <laughs> we'd have lunch. We'd go to like, we were working at Charles Schwab's house at that point in Pebble Beach. You know, all the pickup, you know, we come driving in the first time at Pebble Beach Lodge, and what in the heck? <laughs> they go, it's our work truck. It's got tools on it. <laughs> so I won that battle. And it's all black, and it's just turned, to, and it stayed inside. It never saw a drop of water, anything, and I gave it to a dear friend of mine. This, <clears throat> I worked eight years on this motor. There's an oil pan that goes from the front to the rear, all built of aluminum. So it uh, covers the transmission, the torque converter, and the engine oil is all separated and it's all billet and block sanded and perfectly polished. And then we hid everything, all of the wiring except for the spark plug wires are hidden. So it looks to be two fuel rails up on the top. One of them is the wiring to the injectors. And Ryan Falconer is one of his 600 cubic inch motors, but I've machined everything, fit it perfect. And it, has more money and time than probably any motor that's ever been built in the last 30 years. And Chip Fu saw it and said, I gotta have it. So that's how I ended up with my shop in Eureka. Is that a Falconer? It's a Falconer, mm -hmm. 600 cubic inch. Uh, we ran that on a dump, because I was building it to make a 28 Roadster pickup when I retired. So that was gonna be on my 28 Roadster pickup. And uh, on the dyno, it put out about 830 horsepower at 6,100 RPM. So it wasn't even close to what, it easy to go 1,000 RPM. I mean, 1,000 horsepower back in 1990. So this is the day we're loading it up to take it to Chip's shop. And what I did, I made a, a suitcase that plugged into those cannon plugs, had a gas tank, a battery, and a suitcase, and you could start that up right there. I had it in my office for four years because I hadn't had a car yet, so we could just start it up, freak people out. <laughs> he started building a 37 Lincoln Zephyr. It's really one of the motor. So it, everything on it was just perfectly polished and Quite proud of it. And if you notice, there's no alternator. I used the Harley Davidson, so it's in the vibration dampener. 
so you don't have no, no all, you know, yet it, and that's, that's ready to go in a car. You can see the detail. They put some of those in airplanes, haven't they? Yes, they, they, they started, did it originally. See, this is the kind of detail. Look at that little, just to hold my can and plug in that pan where it comes apart, that little niche right there. Uh, they made carbon fiber, two thirds scale P51s, and they set a lot of records with them. And he got, you know, he used to, because he was next door to me, he was literally 600 feet away. They took a big forklift and made this unit to put the motor on with this big prop on it to get the FAA to approve it. So they'd run. And obviously I showed you at the beginning, I like the column lines. That's where you like them too much. <laughs> so one's for my son, one's for me, and I did one for Junior, who I bought the original column line from. So Cole Foster, my dear friend, Selena's boy, Pat Foster's son, did the work on most of them. Love them or hate them, you know, like, and that's the motor that Ryan Falcon and I built for my car line. It's a six cylinder, 300 cubic inch Ford, but it, it, nothing in it. It's got BMW and throttle body, and we made everything. It puts out 349 horsepower <laughs> in my pickup truck. And we machined everything. Once you got the sickness, you can get rid of it. You can get older, but you can't get rid of the sickness. <laughs> you see how I love the coal. It's the first day we drove it. It's coal foster. You can tune it while you drive it. Yeah, that's the whole idea. You know, the car line, the motor's right there with you. You can't miss it. When there's any hiccups in it, that's the building I wax. <laughs> that's in Eureka by the ocean. I've been very fortunate to be able to live by the ocean. So this is where it all ends. This is my last, that was a few months ago. This is uh, the Hall of Fame and Grand National Roast Show at Sam Bear, <laughs> I mean, Sam Foos, Black and Jerian, Chip, all of us the day I got inducted in 2010. A lot, of, a lot of important people there mean a lot to me. They're just, they're not just important people, they're family, their friends. We've got a great group of people in the hot riding world. Blackie passed away, and that's Joe Balon two years ago. He's got five of my cars in his personal collection. And that's me and George Verison Jr. You might have noticed I've lost a little weight. The doctor said, you know, you want to keep living, Dan? So I lost 85 pounds. By just quitting eating. <laughs> it's just a matter of making your mind up. And this is my lifelong friend Jake, Jim Jacobs, Pete and Jake, at the Grand National Roadster Show in January. And <coughs> it, he had three of his Model A's in the display there. And the next picture I'm really proud of because we're the last of the rat tanks. That's Bob Williams, me. Jake and Suzanne Williams, and we all worked at Big Daddy Ross. Ed Newton is still alive and he's part, but he didn't work there, he worked for. So we're the last of them besides his sons. So that's where we're at at this point. It's my life. Wow. <laughs> thank, thank you for coming and joining us. My pleasure. I know uh, we're a little over on time, but does anybody have any questions for Dan real quick? Yeah, I could come around the audience. What's oh. the value of that Falconer motor? Um, you know, my personal motor or when he sold them? The one that you did, uh, the, the There was $280,000 in it. Say again. $280,000 in eight years yeah. by the time we got it done. It was just thousands of hours. Yes, sir. What was it, Chip put that motor in? I was in his shop right after he got that motor. He, it was a 1937 faux uh, Lincoln Zephyr. Yeah. That's the whole idea, have that V12. Yeah. And you know, he got the chassis built in. He knew what I was trying to do. If you saw the oil pan, had to take, so the belly pan on the suspension and everything came right to the edge, so there was just this little small trim around where the motor sat. 
How much did you work with John Butera? I, little John Butera, and I, you know, his wife delivered my children. Let's put it that way, all right? So I had a lot, a lot, a long time with little John. At his 27T, I was building that Laguna truck in his shop because I closed my shop, and John and I <coughs> hit it off, so I brought my lathe and my mill into his shop, and I was building a 27T for my wife, and he wanted to have one, so I let him have that, and we built the one that he's so famous for. You know, that was all me and a guy named Steve Davis and Willie Desitoff, you know, and no turning back. And I'd been doing all this billet stuff way before, and it, I just keep my mouth shut and go along, because I did what I did, you know, and Boyd Codding says the same thing, he used to, both of them, you know, would come down and visit me. You know, people don't realize that you're the one that got us going. <laughs> Because you know, I just was always anal about this. Is it true that John? Uh, is it true that he welded the doors all up on his car, a lot of his cars, and then sawed them all out so he had a very tight fit? Uh, which, which car? Well, I think it was a thirty-two, three. What? No. He did that. What he did, he was when they were going to Indianapolis. He decided to have a big, like my Peterbilt, but a smaller, you know, like a bird, and that was aluminum. And he didn't want his rivets showing. So that, he welded up all the rivets on that, but he didn't weld the door shut. But he did on the 26th, he had no patience. Little John Patera had no patience. He loved challenge of building like the one side. You gotta make a second part, that ain't fun. So we're in there and I'm, you know, I got there about you know, 10 in the morning one day and he said, Woods, I'm not gonna make any body mounts. I said, well, why? He goes, cause we can just weld this thing. It's sitting right here. He just welded the body right to the frame on that 27. So to this day, you can't take the body off it. It's welded to the frame. <laughs> Any other? Bring the yes, microphone sir. to you. <laughs> when you worked for Lawrence Father, <laughs> were you at his shop? Because I read where he used to throw his change up on the roof when he'd come back from lunch. I'm sorry, what? When you worked for Ed Roth, I had read that when he came back from lunch, he used to take the change out of his pocket, throw it up on the roof of his building. Uh, the, there were so many crazy stories. <laughs> that one I don't remember. But Ed, he would, to, the, to his greatness, if he put up a signal, in this day and age, we all just pass him by, but people that were homeless back then, if he had $200 or $10, he gave it to them. He just opened the window and just hand them whatever he had in his pocket. Mm -hmm. You know, that part was just, you know, part of who he was. Okay. We had some fantastic time there. Yeah, I can't remember who it was that, uh, where I read the story, but they said Ed would throw his change up on the roof of the building, flat roof building. And one day somebody came in, and it's just before he built the old Fang, and they, they wanted him to go in on his car. And he said, like, I'll go in on it as long as the only money I'm putting into it is all the money on the roof. Yeah. And they went up and got a whole bunch of changes. I, I just honestly, there was a, a big stink with the Hell's Angels because, you know, they allowed him, David Mann was doing all these drawings of the motorcycle, you know, the, all that stuff. And Sonny Barger would come and we'd have these confrontations and, you know, they had the, they thought they had the run of the place. So they'd come in and take 200 t-shirts, you know, well, that wasn't part of the deal. So Ed started, you know, this has got to stop. So this is while I was in Vietnam, Jake, Ed, Ed Fuller and forget the other guy, uh, Lebo, they were on for 24 hours there on the roof with guns. And the Hells Angels ended up getting one of the gentlemen that Ed knew, there was a bar called, oh, I don't remember, you know, near it, and they found this guy with a garden hose down his throat, drowned. So it got ugly, you know, there was the Hells Angel thing, but yeah. it all went by and passed away and we're happy that it did. Mm -hmm. and, Maybe do one more question, anybody else? One of the things that I think about with this picture, Dan, is I was so lucky. Robert Williams is one of my heroes, uh, you know, being an artist, and I, I saw him at the Grand National Roadster Show, and I said, will you please take your picture with me? So I posed by him, and I got my camera later, and he had that exact same expression on his face, and I thought maybe it was because I was from Nebraska, or maybe I was just a little goofy, but I'm glad to see he had the same facial expression with, with his Williams. friends. You know, right after we had taken this picture, a couple of, you know, there's a lot of this rat rod people and they're great people, came up and the guy said, excuse me, excuse me, I hear that Dan Woods and Robert Williams, you know, 
and they turn around, yeah, they're standing right there. They come over and he goes, I have to show you. And he had Robert Williams tattooed on his left arm and he's got my milk truck on his right arm. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again for coming and don't forget the vets. Always honor your vets whenever you can. Thank you.